Are you okay? Ladies and gentlemen, assembled company, wherever you are in the world, whatever time of day it is in the world, I've been really looking forward to tonight. Well, welcome, first of all, welcome to the World Storytelling Cafe. And uh, there's nights, I look forward to all the live nights, but I've been, my, my Saturday night out is uh, is uh, Liz Weir's barn, and uh, so I, I go for my virtual night out on a Saturday night. And one of the regulars from uh, from uh, uh, Liz's barn, who I hadn't come across, I must confess, Colin, I hadn't come it, I hadn't come across you before Liz introduced you to me. And uh, but it's he's it, 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 been amazing you know a sort of renaissance man bit of, you know i write i tell stories i take a tradition i work it i sing i do songs about it uh, you know um a brilliant musician um no my name is not leonardo da vinci or whatever uh, 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 uh an antrim equivalent is in fact it is antrim's own leonardo da vinci could you please put your hands together and welcome colin owen Colin, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, thank you very, very much, everybody. I'm going to take myself. I can't look at myself when I'm doing this. I have to have a gallery going here. Um, I, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to start off with my first personal story ever. I don't normally do personal stories, but I've been really, really um, inspired by the likes of Donna Washington and Tim Tingle who are masters at it. And I know it's more popular in America than it is here. And um, I, I'm, I, I'm not overly comfortable with it, but I'm going to start off with one. And uh, of course, it's a true story. It's a personal true, true story. And um, <clears throat> I, have to, I have to do two things before I start this story. I have to explain to our international uh, uh, listeners, and that means everybody from outside Northern Ireland, what a shuch is. Liz will know what a shuch is. A shuch is a drain. It's just a, a hand-dug drain down the side of a field. Tom, you will know what a shuch is, I am sure. And traditionally, they were cleared with a shovel by hand in the wintertime by the farmer. You'll need to remember that. And the next thing I'm going to tell you about is a corn creek. Now, a lot of people will know what a corn creek is. And just in case you don't, I have one here. This is a corn creek. This is a hundred year old corn creek. All right. And this bird here is one of the rarest birds in Ireland now. But 50 years ago, it was one of the commonest. It was one of the commonest farm and birds across Europe, but one single uh, change in farming practice wiped it out virtually overnight. Anyway, Shin Skilella, that's another story. Uh, so you'll need to remember that. It's about the size of a pigeon, all right? And it's a migratory bird. It comes here in April, flies back to Africa in August. All right, let's start the story. Um, I used to live in the village. I live up above the village now. I live out in the sticks, but I used to live down in the village where my little daughter there, Kerry, in the middle there, now lives. And I used to live in a street. My wife and I lived in a wee street called Castle Street. And it runs up from the castle, Glenarm Castle. Beautiful, beautiful place right down by the side of the river. And at the top of the street, which was only about 30 yards long, there were only about 20 houses in this street, by the way. At the top of the street was a pub called a schooner and uh i uh, uh and that's incidentally that's the first place i ever came across les weir 35 years ago the pub sadly now is closed down no no blame on liz there by the way and uh like all the pubs in glenarm of which there were five 30 or 40 years ago they were all full of old characters and i loved them i loved spending time with all those old lads in the in the pub. They were full of crack. Stories were great. Some of the best natural storytellers I've ever heard. And the pubs then were great centers for learning, right? 
And let me tell you what I mean by that. I went into the pub this Saturday night and there was a group of old fellas sitting in the corner and they were obviously engrossed in some big debate. And as I walked in the door, all the heads turned around as they always did. And one of the old fellas, an old lad called Seamus, called me over. Hey, boy. Hey, come here. Come on over here a minute. And I went over and he said, tell them boys there where the corn creek goes in winter. Now, I was often consulted on ornithological matters because I had the reputation of being a bit of a bird watcher. But I couldn't help feeling on this occasion that I was having my leg pulled, right? Because I just assumed that men of their generation, particularly country folk, would all know what the natural life cycle of the corn creek was. Nevertheless, I answered with complete sincerity and I said, Africa. <laughs> Africa. You buck Egypt, you Africa. He said to me, I thought you were supposed to know a wee bit about birds, boy. You know nothing about birds. And I tried to defend myself. I says, no, 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 they do. They come here in April from Africa and they breed and then they fly back to Africa in August. <laughs> do you hear that boy he said? Boy, you're a court Egypt. Do you not even know, a boy like you that's supposed to know about birds, do you not even know that a corn creek hibernates in below the water in the ditches in wintertime? Haven't I disturbed them from their sleep many's a time when I was clearing out the shucks with a shovel? Now, it was my turn to show disbelief. And I was about, I was just about to take issue with Seamus. And then I looked at him. And I looked at his tattered overcoat, tied round the middle with a bit of beeler twine. And I looked at his lopsided glasses, held together with sellotape. And I looked at the gaps in his teeth, where some of his molars and his incisors had fallen out through neglect. And I looked at the whiskey glasses on the table, most of them empty. And a wee bit of wisdom came into my head. And it was, never argue with a fool or a drunk man. And that was the first of three lessons that I learned from that man. Now, many years later, I was very fortunate and I realized a lifelong dream and I acquired a few acres of ground up on the hill above Glenarm in the middle of a moss, which is where I live now. And one very cold winter's day, I was out checking my own shucks, right? And I had my dog with me and my dog was splashing around in the shallow water and it flushed a bird, which seemed to appear from nowhere out from among its feet and it flew over into the moss. And it was about the size of a pigeon. And it had very ungainly flight and long legs hanging behind it. And it looked for all the world like a corn crake. And I rushed home and I got the bird book out. And I looked up the bird book. And there I found it. <laughs> a bird called the water reel. A close cousin of the corn creek, except that it is a resident in Ireland all year round, a lover of damp places, especially man-made drains, very ungainly in flight, rarely seen unless flushed. Confusion with the corn creek probably gave rise to the old myth legend that corn creeks hibernate beneath the water in winter book closed there it was and so i learned the second lesson from old seamus which was that no matter how unbelievable the story there is always a tiny little bit of truth behind it and 
As a consequence of that, I learned the third lesson from Seamus, which was, of course, that the truth is always a little bit more believable if it is embellished with a little bit of fiction. And to an aspiring storyteller like myself, that is pure gold. And that's what I mean when I say those pubs back in those days when I was a young fella were great centers of learning. And I hope that you agree with me that you don't have to be a great scholar to be a great teacher. So thanks to Seamus. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So I'm going to, uh, that wee pub, as I said, like all, most of the pubs in Glenarm are all now closed and all those old characters are all gone very, very sadly. Uh, the pubs are not the crack that they used to be, uh, I'm afraid to say. But there's, and there is one pub still going and it's one called the Meeting House. And it's about five miles behind me here. And I've been going to it since I was 17 years old to play music. And uh, it, it was also a great center for learning because I learned hundreds, literally hundreds of tunes and songs and stories. And I also learned some serious lessons about my capacity to drink Guinness or not, as the case may be. So it is also a, a great center for learning and still is, I suppose. And it's still going, well, at least it was before the, before the lockdown. And I've been going there every Thursday night for years. And Liz turns up from time to time as well. And we sit around and we play tunes and sing songs. And about a couple of years ago, <clears throat> this fella walked in this Thursday night with a guitar case. And he sat down and he asked, could he play? And of course we said yes, because we're very welcoming and anything goes. We've had everything from trumpet playing to uh, Turkish belly dancing. I kid you not, anything goes within reason. And so we said, of course, yes, uh, you, let's hear what you can do. And he, great guitar player, lovely singer, lots of the songs that we already knew and were able to play along with. It was fantastic. And then over the weeks, I got talking to him and I discovered that he was born within a couple of days of me. And he, uh, he uh, him and I, or his mother and my mother, we're in the maternity ward at the same time in the same town. He was from my hometown. His father was a foreman in the same factory that my father was a foreman in. It was amazing. And yet I had never met this man in a small town of, of 20,000 people, which is Larne, where I was born. And there's a good reason for that, how, how I had missed, how him, this guy We've missed other in our lives. And that is because he went to one school and I went to another. Because even now, even today in Northern Ireland, Catholics go to one school and Protestants go to a different school. Unbelievably in this day and age. But that's the way it is. And I thought that that was very sad. And I decided to write a song about it, uh, which is not overly sad, but I, I'll, I'll let you be the judge. And I called the song Left and Right. And uh, the reason why I called it Left and Right, because there's, a, there's, there's a, a phrase that is used in Northern Ireland. It's very specific to Northern Ireland. Well, I suppose parts of Scotland as well. And it is this. You'll hear people saying, your man's a left footer. Or your man kicks with the other foot or he digs with the other foot. And it's a reference to digging peat, believe it or not. Uh, because back in a uh, 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 hundred years ago, when the black local blacksmith made your peat spade or your turf spade, and it would have been the same in Scotland, every blacksmith made a peat spade to a different pattern. And so when the men assembled at the peat moss to dig their peats, they could be identified from which townland they came by the style of their spade. Some of them were left footed, some of them were right footed. And so men were able to say, well, he's from such and such. A townlands. And then those townlands became associated with whether they were Catholic or whether they were Protestant. And so over time, you were able to identify a man's religion 
just by his peach spade. And then that evolved into, he's a left footer. He's a, so, and the expression is used by kicking with the left foot or the right foot or digging with the left foot or the right foot. So that's where the left and right comes from. And uh, I'm going to sing it for you now. Simply called left and right. Met a man the other day I never met before. Should have been acquainted fifty years ago or more. Robbed of the opportunity that was says in my birthright. I dug with my left foot, he dug with his right. They set us on our different paths, well worn by the fools. Still send a little four year olds to segregated schools. Some master long division, some learn to read and write Some master long division Some learn to read and write Fathers both were factory men Working side by side Sons the victims of wrong Tended to divide Taught boys not to meet halfway, but encouraged us to fight. We kicked with our left foot, they kicked with the right. Others took the all star buses in the night of time. Paid for different uniforms, twelve weeks, half a crown. Each to their own daily bread us fish on Friday nights. Some were on the back foot, some goodbye all right. And in that little hide bound place by history defying fifty one weeks of the year we were neighborly and kind. And we were reminded every rowdy bonfire night. Some dug with the left foot, some dug with the right. Must admit I envy them their colorful parades. Long to bang the lambic drum, join the boys' brigade. We kept to our hurling Kayleys all the Sunday night. My dad said I had two left feet, my dad was always right. But Fifty years have come and gone, and in the end we met. Despite the bigots standing to behind the parapet, Love of songs and music proved to be our guiding light. Still I keep time with my left foot, keeps time with his right. I've become the best of friends, beer, bellies and grey hair. Just like fifty years ago, neither of us care. Time is catching up on us, to your eyes we're a sight. For now I limp with my left foot, he limps with his right. We have become the best of friends, beard, bellies and grey hair. Just like fifty years ago, 
neither of us care. Night time is catching up on us, and in some gathering twilight, they'll dig my grave on the left side, his grave on the right. How about I hear in the next world, there is no left and right. Very, very much. I, uh, <clears throat> I see my wee uh, granddaughter is now on there too, somewhere floating around. There she is, Isla. Give us a wee of Isla. Isla is a great pianist and a great dancer. And I'm trying to get her into the storytelling. She tells me great stories, but she won't tell them in public. Not yet, anyway. So... <clears throat> I, uh, I'm going to bring you back to Glenarm now, and uh, I'm going to tell you about a place uh, that, uh, <clears throat> that I walk to almost every day of my life. There's, uh, in fact, I'm going, to, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to show you a picture of it, actually. I know some people here, uh, Steph's there and Liz is there. There's a few people there will know this place intimately because it's a well-known local beauty spot. And it's called the Madman's Window. And that's an old Victorian uh, or Edwardian photograph of it. And the, the thing that you see there, each stone in that archway weighs about 40 or 50 ton easily. But it's not, it's not man-made. It's a natural form, rock formation, unless it was made by the hand of some giant Shin Skilella. That's another story. It's a natural rock formation, and it for frames this window that looks out on to the North Channel. And uh, it's about a mile and a half from the village of Glenarm, and lots of people come and use it to walk in and out. I do myself almost every day. And you're walking right along the coast, and from that coast, I've seen lots of wonderful things, including huge pods of dolphins and so on, which come right in about 15, 20 yards off the coast. Beautiful. And um, some people will tell you versions of how it got its name. Um, and different people tell, have different versions. But this is the right way of it. Years ago, there was a fisherman in Glenarm. And he had built himself up until he had a great going concern. He had 100 lobster creels and two long lines with 50 hooks on each and he had built himself up to a, a, a pitch where he could earn a living from the sea in his wee 16-foot rowing boat. And he didn't have to resort to farm labour or anything of the kind. But he wasn't the kind of man to sit on his laurels. Because the way he looked at it was the, he never knew when a storm might take away some of his gear or uh, that the landlord would put his rent up or the price of fish would come down. And so one autumn time, he decided that he would knit himself a net. And he started about October time and he worked all through the winter nights. And eventually come the following season, he had a net that was three yards deep and a hundred yards long. And he realized he would need some help with this net. So he took a young fellow on. And come the start of the season, out they went and they set this net 100 yards of it out across the stream of the tide and they left it overnight. They went out the next day and right enough, when they started to haul on the ropes, they could hardly pull it in. It was that heavy. And they got five yards in, 10 yards, 15 yards, and not a scale of a fish. They got 20 yards in, 30, 40. And then... They discovered what was weighing so heavily on the net. It was a great grey seal, a massive animal. It was the size of the boat, and it was 16 foot long. Well, the young fella made for the knife straight away to start cutting and hagging at the seal. And the fisherman said, no, wait. Lift its head out of the water. 
And so they lifted its head clear of the water, but its eyes were closed and its body was lifeless. And then all of a sudden there was a big <gasps> gasp of breath. <clears throat> I shouldn't have done that. There was a big gasp of breath. The thing was alive, but it was hanging on by a thread. And so the fishermen directed them that they would start to work and try and free it from the net. So they worked like surgeons and they cut the net from around its fins and around its muzzle. And some of the netting had cut into its flesh like cheese wire. And it was back breaking work because of the size of this animal. Two hours later, backs broken, they took off the last piece of net. And they held it to the side of the boat for as long as they could to see if the thing would revive. But exhausted, they had to let the animal go. And it just hung there in the water, its head on the surface. And eventually, one eye opened, and then the other. And it looked at the two fishermen for long enough and then eventually it disappeared below the waves. And with what little strength they had left, those two men pulled in the rest of that net. And they got it into the boat and they rowed for the river. And every now and again, a seal's head broke the surface and it followed them right in until they were safely in over the bar mouth. Well, the net was ruined. All the fishermen's efforts over the winter was for nothing. But they had their hundred creels and their two long lines and out they went the next day. And when they pulled the two long lines in, there was a fish on every hook. Now on a good day, they might have had a dozen or 15 fish. But today they had a hundred and all of them, big cod. And when they checked the lobster pots, there was one lobster in every creel. On a good day, they had 15 lobsters, but today they had a lot, a hundred, and every one of them big, fine specimens. And the young fella said, if it was like this every day, we would be rich men very soon. Uh, probably we would, said the fisherman, but we'll just put the half of them back anyway. And much against the young fella's ideas and how things should have been done, most of the catch went back in. Nevertheless, there was plenty of buyers for them when they get in. And they worked like that all day and the seal's head popped up and down, followed them in until they were safely over the bar mouth and the fishmongers lined the key and bought every fin and every claw that they landed. And it was the same the next day and the next day, until the end of the season. And the fisherman made, man made up all of his losses and more. But at the end of the season, the young fella said to him that he wanted to see a wee bit of the world. and He didn't want to spend his life on a 16-foot fishing boat rowing about Glenarm Bay. And so he signed on to a merchant man and went away off to see the world. And so the fisherman let it be known that he was looking for help for the following season. But no one came forward. And eventually, <clears throat> one day he was sitting along the quay, <clears throat> mending a lobster creel, and he was approached by a young woman. The fisherman looked up and looked down and looked up again. And she was a comely young lassie, very pretty. And her hair was a colour of kelp. And her eyes were very sincere <clears throat> and as black as sloes. <coughs> and she said, I hear you're looking for help with the fishing. That's right, he said, I am, but it's no work for a woman. She said, I know as much about the sea, if not more than any man. And I'm as able for buying. <laughs> well, he said, if that's the case, sure, it wouldn't cost me any harm to give you a try. And he took her out in the boat. And if the young fella was a good help here, 
She was as good as two men. And they worked all season. And it was the same every day. Hundred cod and a hundred lobsters. And they put the half of them back. Some days they put three quarters of them back. And every day they worked, a seal's head would rise up, have a wee look and disappear again. And it followed them safely in when they were rowing into the river until they were over the bar mouth and tied up. The fishmongers came from far and wide and bought every thing they landed. And working so closely with the young lassie and how good she was and all and how pretty she was, the fisherman became very smitten by her. And eventually he said to her one day when they were out in the boat, you know, he says, you and I make a great team. What would you say if I were to ask you to marry me? She didn't think for any time at all. She said, we can be married, but not churched. Well, he was a little bit taken aback by that, but he agreed to her terms. And within six years, they had four strong sons, all of them full of fun and full of life. They had their mother's hair and the same sincere dark eyes. But as they came near the seventh anniversary of the day they met, the fishermen began to notice that she was acting very strangely and one night when they were sitting at the fire and the Wains were in bed and he was at a cup of tea and smoking a pipe, he asked her, was everything all right? And she didn't answer. She just bid him to follow her down to the beach. And down they went. And she said, husband, I must leave you. What? He said, he was inconsolable. Why? She said, that seal that you saved from drowning in the net that day, he was my father. He's king of the silkies. It is he who has been looking after you and it is he who has helped you to prosper. It is he who sent me to bear your sons to help you when you are older. But I love you, he said, and, and the children love you. And I love you too, she said. And I love them, but I cannot stay. I can only live in land for seven years. And any longer, I will never be able to go back to my own kind and I will die. The man was distraught. And she said, come to the limestone arch whenever you need me. Just call and I will come night or day. And she bent down and from under a stone, she took out a seal skin. She dropped her clothes, donned the seal skin and with one look over her shoulder at him, she disappeared into the sea. When the villagers found her clothes on the beach the next morning, they said, poor girl, poor, poor girl, she has taken her own life there was always something strange about that wee lassie. And then when they started to notice that her man walked out to the limestone arch every night and was heard talking as if to his beloved, they said, poor, poor man, poor man. His head is away with grief. You see, they didn't know the right way of it. So they just made up their own story. And that is how the limestone arch got its name as the mad man's window. But years later, when the fisherman's children were all up and away, he disappeared himself. And the people said, poor man, he must have taken his life too after all these years. See, they didn't know the right way of that either. I can tell you that he didn't take his own life. Him and his silky wife are alive and well, yet they're living down in the kelp forest where the king of the silkies has his throne. 
And you're probably wondering how I know that. Well, let's just say I have it on good authority. Thank you. Brilliant, brilliant. Head come. Thank you very much. John, you jump in here at any time if you're if you want to interject or say well, anything. I, 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 uh, uh, apart from just, I, I, I'm mesmerised, Colin. I, 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 I'm just. I, I'm, I'm just down in the kelp forest at the moment. <laughs> a, I'm just letting you rattle on or sing or do whatever you do because you, it's it's magic. It is it's as magical as your stories. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. Well, I'm uh, I'm going to if you'll forgive the pun, I'm going to zoom out of Glenarm now, and I'm gonna. Zoom away back and look at Ireland as a whole. Back in the year 1847, the Irish famine was at its height. And people were dying by the hundreds of thousands from starvation and disease. And they were um, emigrating to Canada and America and going over to England and Scotland. And when I was a kid at school, they used to tell us that a million people emigrated or died. And then in the same book, it told you that the population of Ireland was 8 million and after the famine, it was 4 million. And I could never work that out where those other 3 million people went. The truth of the matter is that the population of Ireland was probably nearer 9 million. And at the end of the famine, it was around about 4. So about 5 million people either emigrated or perished. Probably the worst event in Irish history. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, at the same time that the Irish famine was at its height, there was a group of about a thousand Choctaw people from Mississippi, from their tribal lands in Mississippi. They had been being moved in groups of about a thousand or two thousand for a decade. And the last group of about a thousand were moved off their um, tribal lands to what they called Indian Territory in Oklahoma. And uh, they, they, they were in a very poor condition because there was nothing to hunt. There was no, they didn't, they weren't farmers as such. And so they were the first people, the very first Native Americans to be put on a trail of tears. And um, they arrived, the last of them arrived in 1847 in Oklahoma in very poor condition. And the people as a whole were on their knees. And yet, no, when they heard, when they heard about the Irish famine, which they did, goodness knows how, but when they heard about the Irish famine, they collected $176, which equates apparently to today's figures to somewhere in the region of three to five thousand dollars it was a huge amount for them at that time given their dire circumstances and they sent that money over to ireland they donated it to the irish famine relief fund because they were so touched by the stories and they felt such empathy and that gesture of humanity uh, has engendered a decades-old relationship between the irish people and the Choctaw Nation and the Irish president, more, more than one of them, have been over to Oklahoma and have visited the Choctaw people. The Choctaw elders have been over here in Ireland. And I don't know if Tim Tingle's here tonight. I, I, I hope he is. Um, I hope he's listening. I would like to dedicate this uh, to Tim Tingle, who's a fantastic storyteller. I hang on every word that comes out of the man's mouth. And uh, he is... Uh, of the Oklahoma Choctaw Nation. And I'd like to dedicate this, this song to him because um, I, I first heard about this story a couple of months ago and um, it, it, it just touched me so much I decided I had to write a song about it. And um, the relationship between the Irish people and, and the Choctaw has, has now culminated in uh, 
Cork University, for example, giving scholarships to Choctaw young people who come over here to study. And the, 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 there is a public artwork called Kindred Spirits, 20 foot high stainless steel bowl of eagle feathers down in a place called Middleton in Cork. And uh, that's, where I, that's where I got the name uh, for this song, actually. And uh, uh, I've, 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 I've called it uh, Kindred Spirits. And I'm going to have to pull the words up of it if you do, if you don't mind, which is very unprofessional, I know, but um, I uh, I don't want to make a mistake on it. Um, and uh, one of the most beautiful things about uh, writing this song uh, is that um, when I the first time I sang it in uh, Tim Tingle's company, he uh, told me he was moved to tears, uh, possibly even the second time. And he told me a story about his own great-grandmother who uh, perished on the Trail of Tears. And uh, so I want to dedicate this song to Tim and um, the, uh, the other members of the Choctaw Nation who perished. Kindred Spirits. <laughs> I was just a young boy I didn't understand When my father said Be brave son We must leave our land No more hunting by the river For the beaver and the deer Took all we could carry Our long trail of tears my people walked in silence Was the chalks away Our white fathers had commanded We had to obey So many of our elders Children fell on the trail My mother was among those Passed beyond the veil Kindred sorrows, kindred tears, kindred longings, kindred fears, kindred spirits on a trail of tears. We left our sacred mother mound, built on the earth in stones, birthplace of our nation. Our ancestors' bones bore away our stories, songs we used to sing. We held on to the Choctaw faith, every living thing. Kindred sorrows, kindred tears, kindred longings, kindred fears. Spirits on a trail of tears. When we heard the cries of hunger from a land beyond the waves, broken as we were ourselves, we sent all we could raise. We walked beside those strangers on their distant trail of tears. My father was among those across the miles and years. Kindred sorrows, kindred tears, kindred longings, kindred fears, kindred spirits on a trail of tears. Learned of Ireland's trouble. Of her valleys green, her mountains and her rivers, just like home it seemed. Her people, just like us, were chaff blowing on the wind. Grief and torment care not for the color of our skin. Kindred sorrows. Kindred tears, kindred 
longing kindred fears kindred spirits on a trail of tears kindred sorrows kindred tears kindred longings kindred fears kindred spirits on a trail of Oh, Kai. Now, before you go, oh, fantastic. fantastic. Heard that before, I could hear it another thousand times. Uh, Thank you, John. Now, now if, yeah, if, if this was live and if, we were, if you were on a stage now, people would be stomping and clomping and shouting for more. But before you give them any more, I need to remind people, because had they been night tender, I would have been either at the door collecting money from you all. Or if I'd been in America, I might have... Well, I learned when I was working in America that you didn't leave the tip jar on the, on the stage because heart, that meant people had to come forward and put money in it. So you'd get someone to walk round with the tip jar, and, and, and that was very effective. Well, I can't walk round you all, but if you go to the site, don't, don't leave yet. But if you go back to the site when you leave, and you'll see below Colin's name, just on the first night, a little hat. And if you click on that, you can drop whatever. It takes dollars, it takes euros, it takes pounds, it takes whatever you care to put in there. You don't put your granny in because she won't fit in the virtual hat. But apart from that, but I'm sure, you know, I'm sure Colin would appreciate it. But right now, Colin. <clears throat> Could you give us a little more? Okay. Um, I, I've just, I haven't been able to read, I very much apologize for not being able to read any of your messages, but I did happen to notice that Tim Tingle is on, which I'm so happy about. He is a uh, tremendous human being, and I look forward to the day that I can meet him in person, as I do with many of you. This is one of the beautiful things about lockdown. There's lots of negatives, but for me, there has been more positives because... I've met so many fantastic people. There's Brian MacArthur on there, uh, originally from here, but living in Scotland here. Meet every Thursday night for singing. Donna Washington, Tim Tingle. There's far too many to mention. Heather Yule, Tom Muir, fantastic. Um, Sheehan, Ibs, Deirdre McCarthy. There's lots of them. I'm not going to name any more because I would have to go through all the pages. I couldn't, I couldn't not name John Rowe, though. But I'd like to especially thank Liz Weir because she has mentored me and she has put up with me badgering her about stories and all kinds of things. And uh, we've exchanged lots of emails and uh, we ours and loads of coffee and a glass or two of wine. And I am very, very, very much appreciative of her. In fact, I wouldn't be here doing this this evening if it weren't for Liz. So I want to, I want to uh, dedicate this next story to Liz. Um, I, uh, I, I like to perform all my own stuff. That doesn't mean that I don't do traditional stories. I do. I just ha don't happen to have done any tonight. Um, but if you, I could be prevailed upon to do one, I guess. But I'm going to do a story for uh, and dedicate this to Liz. And it's probably my most recent story. And it's simply called Story. There was once a young man, way, way back at the beginning... And as he approached manhood, a strange feeling began to rise up in him until it became like a burning coal in him and he, he couldn't even sleep because of it. And then one day he met the most amazing young woman. She was so exciting and exhilarating that she took the young man's breath away. She had the free spirit of a wild animal. And her name was Adventure. And the young man was smitten with her and soon they ran away together. And they sailed the stormiest oceans and they never slept with excitement. They climbed the highest mountains and kept each other warm. They came across the hottest deserts and they loved 
every single step of the way. But then, as time went past, the young man began to realize that adventure's desires could not be sated. He began to tire of her. He simply, physically, he could not keep up with her. And eventually he said, adventure, I love you. I love you, but I'm not in love with you. Um, I'm sorry. And whew, he left. And he traveled alone for the longest time. And he was beginning to despair of ever finding anyone else to share his life with. When he met the most alluring woman he had ever met in his life. She had long, curly eyelashes. She had cherry red lips and long fingernails to match. She was very, very curvaceous. And she wore the most tantalizing clothes. They lived in a superb palace together, carpeted in tiger skins. Their bed was made of the feathers of the rarest birds. They wore the most expensive furs and silks, and they dripped in jewelry. They, their furniture was made of the finest, rarest timbers and inlaid with ivory and tortoise shell. And they dined on shark fin soup and the finest cuts of whale meat, and they imbibed aphrodisiacs made from powdered rhinoceros horn. But after a while, the young man began to get bored with wealth's vulgarity. At night, when she removed her false eyelashes and wiped off her red lipstick and pulled off her false nails, she didn't look quite so attractive. And when she undressed behind closed doors and stepped out of her corset, well, she was positively ugly and he began to be repulsed by her. And eventually he said, um, well, it's not you. It's not you. It's me. I'm sorry. And he left. Whew, gone. And he traveled for the longest time. And he was beginning to resign himself to the fact that he might just have to live the rest of his life on his own. Whenever he met the sweetest, most beautiful girl he had ever seen in his life. At first, he thought she was just a little bit plain. She wore no paint nor powder. She dressed in homespun clothes. And everywhere she went, she went barefoot. She was clever, though, and funny, sometimes a little emotional, uh, but mostly she was very wise. And her name was Story. And he fell head over heels in love with her. And when he looked into her eyes, he could see everything in the whole world. And when she put her lips on his and slipped her tongue into his mouth and their tongues entwined. She gave him the language of poetry. And it was all so romantic. There and then he asked her to marry him and she said yes on one condition. Our children will always bear the name of story. And in return, I promise you that when all the oceans have dried up and all the mountains turn to dust and the desert's frozen over and all the money in the world is spent, there will still be a story somewhere in the universe. And so the young man agreed. How could he not? And they had the longest, most passionate most faithful love affair in the history of the world. They gave birth to so many children and so many grandchildren and so many great-grandchildren all down through the generations. 
And that is why today, no matter where you go in the world, you will always be able to find a story. Thank you. Oh. Wonderful. Beautiful. Wow. Come on, Colin. Thank now, you very much. Now, Colin, if yes, we... Uh, so I just need to... I'm trying to do two things at once here. I'm trying to answer a question from Donna. And uh, there's a... Uh, um, uh, the, if we want to, if we retire to the bar for a minute and people unmute themselves and they can ask you questions or it'd be good if if you talk to Colin first before you talk to each other, that'd be kind of, because he is, he, you know, he Colin quite rightly is a centre of attention. So, and, but, but do, do feel free to ask questions or just tell him how wonderful he is. Um, John, can I say one thing before before that happens? Yep. I would sincerely like to thank you very much for inviting me on here tonight. Uh, can't thank you enough. I've absolutely loved it. And thank you also to, and you're going to have to pronounce the name again for me, please. Yulio. Yulio. That's the one. Yeah. Yulio. Thank you so much, Yulio, you, wherever you are. You've been fantastic. There you are. He's just Thank put his you. face back up. He's a bit shy. He's like those tech, you know, those people who sit backstage and you ask for a round of applause and they sort of put the hood over their head and sort of, that's why I work backstage. <laughs> Yulio's yeah. a bit like that, but we, we couldn't do without it. Uh, I think um, Liz Weir is going yeah. to be first up there. Colin, uh, can you tell people that you're, going to be taking part in the Glen Storytelling Festival virtually. Tell them your plans. Yes. Yes. Uh, obviously, the Glen Storytelling Festival is going virtual like every every other festival this year. And uh, Liz, uh, being the dynamo that she is, she's working away backstage, organizing all this. And what she has organized this year, instead of all those fantastic live events that she normally organizes, she's organizing... Um, um, virtual events and a lot of what she's doing is she's lo using local storytellers like myself which I am very happy about I'm very sad that the event is not live because I've, I've loved it the last two or three years but I'm very excited about doing the virtual stuff and where myself along with others are videoing uh, stories it's based in the glens of Antrim a lot of them on location as it were we're going to be so if the story is about the ghost in Ballygally Castle we're going to be in the ghost room in Ballygally Castle and those are all going to be uploaded. And we're, we're doing that in the next couple of weeks, and we're super excited about that. And so the event is from the 1st first, first to the 4th of October, and you'll be able to access all this stuff online. Thanks, Les. I thought someone was going to ask what's in my cup. <laughs> <laughs> Well, prohibition tea, I should think. <laughs> What's in your cup? Guinness. <laughs> Always um, Guinness. Uh, I thought it would have been unprofessional to have a big pint of Guinness, so, but I can tell the truth now. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Colin, what interests me, uh, and it has from the moment I first saw you, saw you is, uh, is the way you combine... You keep tradition, but it's but it's very you, it's very contemporary. You know, it's like a, it's very much a living tradition, and it's it, uh, I mean, it's partly because you do your original. It's original, but you you take all those elements and put it in. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that, or does it just happen? Is it just well, what you do? It, 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 it does hap just happen to some degree, but I mean, I've been um, reading these stories for decades since what was was. A, a young teenager. Uh, my, my first book ever was about sea monsters and all this kind of thing when I was 10. So I've been reading about this stuff for, for decades and I'm, I've been singing folk songs for decades and there's a, a lot of stuff about ghosts and all that kind of thing. My, I'm, I'm the youngest member of a family. My, my, mother, was, <clears throat> my mother was 43 or 44 when she had me. Wow. So, you know, my grandparents were born in the 1880s and so they, they, genu they didn't tell these stories about banshees as stories. They told this stuff because it was real to them. They believed it, genuinely believed it. 
And uh, I kind of was brought up with that kind of stuff. Uh, my mother told, all my mother's stories were personal stuff about the war and her upbringing and all that kind of thing. And they were fascinating. And she was the youngest member in her family as well. And so uh, just within a couple of generations, you're, you're back a long, a long way. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of brought up with all that th sort of thing. But um, I also like to bring lots of my own experience to, 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 to the stories. And I, I wouldn't normally do this, I guess, but just, just in, in the, in, to tell you about the, 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 the uh, uh, madman's window story. When I was 17, I spent a year with a fisherman in a 16-foot boat, and he had 100 lobster pots and 100 uh, and long lines and all. And we spent all winter, and we made this net, and it was 100 yards long. It was nine. That, that's all true, by the way. And the first time we said it, we caught a gigantic seal. And uh, that has stuck in my head all these years. And uh, I've just incorporated it into that story uh, and used all the old traditional motifs and so on to, to, make, a, to make a story out of it. I think, and, and, I the, think and the you, Mad Man's window was real as well, of course. Really your is. use of landscape is fantastic. I mean, when, when you're talking, I mean, I, I, spent, I spent a lot of the early 60s hitchhiking around, uh, around Ireland and especially the, the north and that to Donegal and stuff. And... Uh, it was just, and a lot of those images just come flooding back when 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 you're talking. It's just, uh, it's a fantastic use of language. Mm -hmm. Well, well, I mean, I, I so love, much. I love someone else unmute themselves and yeah. ask a question. I love the Irish countryside, and I, um, I you know, I, I'm out walking every day, and look, one of the, one of the things Les uh, told me, and her, when I when I when I did the sort of storytelling training with Les. So we talked about walking a story and I kind of, I suppose I kind of do that naturally. And I guess lots of storytellers do. Um, but I get, I get huge amounts of inspiration from being in the outdoors, climbing hills. My wife and myself do a lot of hill walking and, and all that kind of thing. And um, I, so, uh, and, and, and I do a lot of that in Scotland, by the way, as well, which is a great inspiration to me. And I love the Scottish islands, the Hebrides, which are only, a short 45 minute boat right away and a very fast boat that is and we, we, we would do quite a bit of that and play music over in Jura and Isla and all that kind of thing so it's, uh, that's all very inspirational to me you know. Alan do you write any stories about your animals from your menagerie? Oh yeah uh, I, I use uh, I, falconry as my as my big thing since I was a kid and I fly and train I've trained lots of birds I, uh, one of my big claims to fame is I trained a couple of snowy owls for the first Harry Potter movie. And uh, I, got, I got a lot of mileage out of that over the years. And uh, wow. I, uh, I, I've, I've written, for example, you may have heard the, the one I do, A Bird in the Hand, about the Cullen Moore, the old Irish chieftain who uh, um, is a falconer. Perhaps not. But then, anyway, yes, I do. I use lots of... I, a lot of my stories in, in, are about the landscape, or include animals, or both. I, I, I'm, I'm a great lover of nature and keep a lot of animals, and I, I use them, <laughs> and I'm, I like to use their characters in the story and so on. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Deirdre. I, I think, Colin, just if I could come in, it's it's in, in, in four days or four evenings, I've heard you tell the Selkie story for the second time, and it just captivates me completely. It's just such a wonderful story. So much I can just I can just like feel oh some emotion or something in there. It just really pulls me in. Well, I, I, I do like to put a lot of emotion. It's not not that I like to. I do. I, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, ashamed myself here now. Sometimes when I'm reading the story for the very first time to my wife, I, I, I'll get emotional. I'll choke up and I'll, a tear will come to my eye. And I'm investing, I mean, when I when I, that story that I told you about the madman's window, I'm right back there when I was 17 and we pulled that big sea land. So I'm, I'm kind of living it as well, you know. Yeah. So I'm, 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 I didn't intend it to be the case, but I guess the emotion comes through in the, in the story. And when I hear comments from the like of you, Shane and John Rowe and so on, uh, I, I, uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm very humbled because you're all excellent storytellers and I, I hang on every word that you utter as well so thank you very much well, we're learning from you i think <laughs> and, 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 and really just, sorry 
someone else who's coming in. Well, I was just saying he's very modest. Les wouldn't let me be, get over my station, I can assure you. Les would probably say, don't forget the bowl you were baked in. <laughs> <laughs> and, and your songs that, that have got, you know, they're, they're timeless, but they're, you know, I, I mean, they're just, um, they fit into a particular sort of song that I love anyway. But, you know, that, that are about real, real things and, and, and bringing history together. And the one I can see Tim at the bottom there, you know, uh, and, 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 and it, it tells us about stuff that we didn't. You know, story and song tells us more about history than a university course, you know, <laughs> it's because, you know, it, 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 and, and it does it from, you know, it touches the heart every time. And, and, and just that, mm -hmm. you know, until you, you did, you, until you told the story behind the song. And, uh, and I think I, I was listening to, you cut in on one or, where Tim was, or followed Tim on one of Liz's ones where Tim told, told the story behind the song. And it was just that whole, you know, and it's like coming together. It's fantastic, and and you manage, and to condense it into a song, is just, uh, you know, I I I I, I, might have, I love Ralph, Ralph McTurry's an old mate of mine, and I just love him to listen to 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 that stuff because it would you know it would just go, it fits into sort of his whole song I've been listening to Ralph McTurry since I was a very. If young I might song. add a word there. There will come a time when we'll be on the same stage. I'll tell the story and you do the song. I would love it. I would love it. Yeah. Liz and I will compete to who can promote that first. <laughs> She's probably 100 miles ahead of me. <laughs> Just to come back to what you were saying there, John, about learning um, more from stories and song. Uh, the first thing that came into my head when you said that is that brilliant line from Bruce Springsteen that in the song, I think, uh, I can't remember the name of the song now, but he says, I learned more than a, from a three minute record than I ever learned in school. And uh, that kind of encapsulates, I think, what you're, what you're saying there. Colin, if I can, good to see you. Baden, Prince. One of my uh, other uh, favourites. <laughs> I'm, I'm still, I'm still getting trauma therapy from that last story you told me. <laughs> I can't apologise enough. Um, I think Liz might have answered the question I was about to ask you, which is, um, is there a tension for you between writing and performing songs and telling stories? But uh, is there and, a preference and, or? No, 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 no. Oh, uh, uh, between songs and stories. Do you mean Ben, mm -hmm. or do you mean between I writing whether and performing? You, between writing songs and telling stories, did is there any tension for you? But Liz has just put something up saying, in Ireland, the two are totally integrated. Oh, no, they're that's but, you know totally and 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 mm. uh, I, I mean, I, I go through phases where I'll write song after song after song. And then they dry up, but then I'll write story after story after story, and they, or or and then in between times, I mean, me and you have discussed this privately, and I sent you a poem which I described to you as a field song, which it is, and and, and but regardless, I'm, I write all the time. Uh, I've discovered that that is the best way to do it, no matter even if you don't feel like it, sit down and write. Um, sometimes something good comes, and sometimes it doesn't. And, uh, but but uh, I, I thought I thought maybe you were asking is there any tension between writing and performing and and if if that was part of your question well, no it's not anyway I'll, I'll I'll answer it anyway even though it wasn't uh, there's not to me it's a a circular thing if I wasn't able to perform I don't know what I would do uh, uh, because I need to close that circle all the time um, yeah. Thanks, Baden. It's lovely to see you. Well, it's been a wonderful. It's been a wonderful night. It's been one, and we've got we've got more wonderful nights. If I can, if I can do a little promotion for the future, cut in on the on the collie now. Um, on Monday, we're on Monday night. We do a program connecting the world by story, and we have different storytellers 
um, where we're, um, this Monday, but sometimes it's a theme, sometimes it's a discussion. This Monday, it's, uh, we're, we're looking at a foolish, uh, uh, mischievous and, um, uh, uh, and disobedient boys. Uh, and, uh, of course, they, they, it's all fiction. There's no such things as those people. And uh, then, uh, and the following Monday, uh, well, I've got an international panel. I've got Antonio Rocha uh, from... Um, He's Brazilian, living in uh, in in, America, in in Maine, uh, and uh, Zuha from uh, Morocco, and I've got different people. And we're we're talking about the future of storytelling, not just uh, not just post COVID, but you know how storytelling is changing, how it's developing, and all, so that's going to be a really interesting discussion. And next Sunday we have a favourite. I know of some people that are up here. Uh, we've got Maria Watson doing next Sunday. So yeah, that's put a smile on Lisa's face. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, a, so and, uh, you know, if you haven't seen Maria, um, just uh, just that's another must. Uh, in fact, I th and 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 then, and then oh, just it just goes on and on but please please visit please come and visit us don't make this the only visit to us um and uh has anyone else or shall i bring proceedings to a close let close just like to say one more thing uh john i'd like to thank everybody who uh pitched in tonight thank you so much it is absolutely. I, I wish I could have you all on one screen. I can. I'm kind of flipping back here. I'm hoping that I catch most people. Thank you so much. Absolutely uh, enjoyed that, and it's lovely to see all those friendly, smiling faces. And I am so looking forward to Maria Watton, who is another one I cannot wait to meet in person. Thank you very much. And if I can, if I can remind people about the tip jar, how that works. If you click on the hat, it goes straight to Colin's PayPal. So you, it's just like dropping, dropping, dropping something in PayPal. Um, and uh, it's like, uh, you know, I'm, but, and people talk about donation fatigue, but for the Americans, it would be usual because if I go to Austin and I go around the music bars, I have to make sure I've got a whole stack of dollars in my pocket, single dollars, because I'll probably hit six or seven tip jars of an evening. And in one venue, you might get three different tip jars from three different performers. So don't talk to me about uh, donation fatigue. Um, uh, that's, that, that's, that's kind of a, that's, but don't worry. But some people deserve it anyway. And that, so another round of applause, please, for Colin. Yay. Right of you. That was a brilliant night, Colin. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colin.